you are taking young blood and you put that into your system in order to live forever, to be immortal. So my question to you is, how important is it for that young blood to be coming from a virgin? Okay, very interesting question. So number one, it's not young blood, it's young plasma, right? So so a lot of people, they, they confuse the words. So I'm an OBGYN and I have been practicing medicine for 35 years where I've hung blood, hung plasma, hung platelets to save people's lives. If you see a pregnant woman have a baby and try to bleed and pregnant women have what's called postpartum hemorrhage, we have to give them all kinds of factors. What we've learned with research is that plasma, which is the liquid part of the blood without the cells from young, mostly college students that volunteer to give plasma, no different than the 30 year old that gives it to the Red Cross, the 50 year old that gives it to the Red Cross. They donate blood, they donate plasma. One of the girls that works in my office donates plasma twice a week. It's good for her. It cleans out some of the bad stuff. They filter it when they remove it. And it's, it's, it's helpful in the hospital in an emergency situation. There are kids that are 18, 19, 20 that also donate to the Red Cross, to the hospital to help people, right? That's what it's all about. And it helps them too. So all we're doing with the young plasma is taking the voluntarily given portion of that young man or woman who is aged between 18 and 24 and turns around and says, I wanna help people. So that donation will help other people because those young factors when added to an aging system will help, I don't wanna even say rejuvenate, it will help rejuvenate because there's growth factors and peptides in there. But a lot of the molecules that you can't make anymore when you get older, what happens is, is these molecules now are replaced. So your system runs more efficiently. It has nothing to do with vampire. It has nothing to do with coming from a virgin. You know, people on the internet, because there's no no backlash, right? People can type whatever. Oh, we're sucking blood from whatever. Well, if that's the case, then the Red Cross has been sucking blood from people for years. So the concept behind this, and it's beneficial. It's not about living forever. I did a study that we gave the young plasma to people with Parkinson's. So if you took my 25 year old son and my 29 year old son, and you told them about this study and said, look, we're seeing all these neurodegenerative diseases, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, MS, and I found a way to help these people. My young kids are gonna go, mom, that's great. Because you know what's gonna happen? Those people that are sick, how are my kids going to take care of that? Who's going to pay for that? Who's going to pay for those hospitalizations? The country's already basically bankrupt. So what we're doing is it's not about living forever. It's living rectangularly. It's about living a healthy life. So, so I do diet. I eat clean. I exercise regularly. I make sure I get eight hours sleep. I'm an OBGYN. I do functional medicine. I've got a tough, stressful job but I modulate that and then the plasma comes in to help support what my body, even doing everything right, can't do anymore. And the kids that donate are thrilled. It, their body regenerates it. And think about it. If you turn around, in fact, you took my young kid and said, will you donate this because it's going to really help people with Parkinson's. You don't think there's a smile on their face every time those kids walk out the door. I did something to be positive in the world. And the kids get money for school. They get book money, they get computer money, they get money towards their tuition. So it helps them and they're helping the aging population. They're helping the world. Isn't that what everybody talks about we need more of? You know, you have an extremely hard job here. It's literally defending the undefendable. In fact, I would like to help you here. 
there is a book from Walter Bloch called Defending the Undefendable, and I would like to read a few paragraphs from it. This is from the chapter, The Human Organ Merchant. And I would like you to reflect on this. In the days of yore, there was no crisis in spare body parts. Organ transplants were an utter impossibility, the stuff of science fiction. Only Dr. Frankenstein had any need for live organs. But nowadays, thanks to the magnificent discoveries and new techniques of modern medicine, these possibilities are upon us. The difficulty here is that our legal economic system has not kept up with advancing medical technology and the property rights we each have in our own bodies. I maintain that deregulation of this market is the solution to the transplant problem. It seems cruel and unfeeling to discuss the market for used body parts in much the same manner we might use to describe the used car market. But this is only because in our present society, while we can appreciate the miracles of modern medicine without necessarily comprehending them, we have such poor understanding of the miracles of the marketplace that we cannot even begin to appreciate them. So let us sit back, relax and calmly and dispassionately consider this idea on its own merits, all preconceptions and biases to one side. This is the tried and true process we rely upon to bring us all the other necessities of life, food, clothing and shelter. We do not depend upon voluntary donations for the provision of the goods and services. Whenever a good is in short supply, its price is too low, and the case of human organs is no exception. Let us allow free enterprise to work in the field of blood, bone marrow and transplantable organs and save us all a lot of pain, sorrow and suffering and tragedy. I think you're comparing apples and oranges there. To turn around and talk about organ transplant would be, those are right, somebody's having a heart transplant, they have to get a heart from somebody that is dying, right, or dead. It's very different than a young college student, again, to turn around and say, I'm going to volunteer to do this. And, and perhaps then you've got to think about what's been going on for the last hundred years, right? Because where do you think not only, again, the Red Cross and the hospitals get their blood from voluntary donations, but where do a lot of the pharmaceutical companies that make chemotherapy drugs and a lot of other drugs, there's plasma in those. Those are all donated, but they're donated by live people who walk in the door, say, hey, I wanna do something to help and walk out the door and they get a little reimbursement for it. So I think to look at plasma donation and blood donation in the same as the aspect of organ donation, I think you're, it's, it's not, I don't wanna say the argument or defending the undefendable, it's a different conversation. It's a stronger case. My case is completely different. Plasma is completely different. Again, look at the last hundred years. Call the Red Cross and turn around and say, okay, read this book, no more blood. Can't, can't have people donate. It's a whole different animal. That was a good start here, Diane Ginsberg. Welcome. You are currently the fourth on the Rejuvenation Olympic leaderboard, the absolute leaderboard, the most important leaderboard. So arguably you are the fourth slowest aging person in the world. Could you tell me a couple of things about your statistics here? Uh, so your Dunedin pace was uh, 0.7. Your chronological age was 57, uh, according to the leaderboard. Uh, what, what else can we know about like heart facts? Uh, about you. So a couple interesting things that that I think are almost I don't want to use the word comical about being fourth on the leaderboard is that I am an OBGYN. So I spent I went four years to high school, four years to college, four years to medical school, 
four years to OB-GYN residency. One of the best ways to speed aging and try to die is to go to medical school. If that doesn't happen, <laughs> then do an OB-GYN residency. And I'm now chronologically, I'm going to be 60 in September. I'm 59. So when I went to residency, they didn't have the 80 hour work week, right? They, they've gotten easier on the residents mental health. So we used to work 36 hours on get a little bit of sleep at home, 12 hours, and you had to be back to the hospital to work your next 36 hour shift. Then I was always in a very small private practice. So I worked probably 10 to 15 nights a month on ob call, up all night, pager going, delivering babies. On top of that, I'm an endurance athlete. I, I, I've done a bunch of marathons, Boston, New York. Um, I've done two full Ironmans, a bunch of half Ironmans, and now I'm getting ready to do a Spartan race. So I'm working my upper body to try to do that. So, so I listened all the years as a distance athlete to people go, oh, that Ironman will kill you and marathon will kill you and those people are so sick. So it's, it's interesting that on the leaderboard that I am fourth. And as an, a physician, I do hormone replacement. My, my passion is longevity, but especially females. I think the menopause female space is empty and women are really struggling. The, the hormone replacement studies in the past have been refuted. Women don't wanna take estrogen. I've got estrogen optimization in my system. So it's, it's really interesting that, that with such a difficult, you would think high cost of doing business on the physics of my body that I would be where I am on the rejuvenation Olympics. And actually very interesting. So I got a little plasma in 2018. I got, I've got a bit then, and then I didn't do any plasma until this, the beginning of this year again. So my standing on the rejuvenation Olympics wasn't even with tons of young plasma. I've just used it again and I found that I, I'm recovering better from running, but that was really in my crazy lifestyle. And one of the things I think that makes a really big difference, and I've really studied this, epigenetics versus blood age versus now the new omic age, which really is interesting is that my Dunedin pace of aging is 0.7, but when I did another separate blood clock, my blood clock is completely different. My blood clock shows that I'm 58 years old when they look at certain things there. So, so and my omic age, it, which is True Diagnostics newer test, says that I'm only aging slower than 19% of the population. So, so our, our number one issue I think that we have is what are your genetics and are you living the lifestyle to optimize your genetic? I carry three of the four genes for obesity and I don't lose weight with calorie restriction. And I'm 5'5", five, five, about 130 pounds, 35 pounds now. So what I think happens is that you take that genetic profile and you turn it into a marathon runner, that's what optimized the situation, right? If I had not been as much of an athlete and sat in front of a desk all day, I think then I would not be living my genetics. So I think the situation would be different. So I think, yes, we need to eat clean. Yes, we need to sleep eight hours, which I do now. I don't deliver babies anymore. We need to exercise. We need, especially women, we need to strength train. That is under appreciated in the world. But I think that the key to longevity is going to be what are you and how are you maximizing that? And for me, it just happened to come together, right? Somebody that's got a little different genetics, maybe they would be better different in their exercise regimen. That's, there, there's not a one size fits all. Again, it's just, it's optimizing that combo, right? If, if you have kind of, I always say warrior genetics and I had a traipse across the ground paleolithically you know, for miles and miles and miles. So the insulin resistance helps. So me doing marathons and Ironmans made my body function optimally, which kept the pace of aging slow because my cost of doing business was lower. Do you have any vices that could make it worse? I love distance running. So I think that I have hopefully taken whatever my vices are and made them socially acceptable. 
I'm, I don't really drink. I drink zero now. I've stopped. A um, little bit I was a wine drinker. I don't smoke. I don't – drugs spook me out. I sleep – like I said, I sleep eight hours. I don't – I mean, I'm not a perfect person, but I don't know that I have anything – vice wise significantly that makes a difference but because running gives me such a natural feel good high when not having vices make a difference yeah yeah I probably work too hard i probably spend too much time in front of research oh, yeah. i'm a real researcher person so i see patients i worry about my patients but then i spend a lot of my downtime if i'm not racing probably researching so i i probably should breathe a little bit more breathe a little deeper, meditate a little more. So probably my biggest vice would be my lack of finding downtime. Oh yes. Yeah. So how long was that uh, very intense period after medical school for you in, in your life? Four years. Four years. So, mm -hmm. we, so we do an internship and then three years of residency. And then I finished my residency, had my first son and boom, went into practice right away. Took maybe three weeks off and went right into practice. I see, I see. So that, that could have been the most unhealthiest time of your life. Oh, internship and residency. Yes, absolutely. But you have to do that. You have to, you, you take, and that's what I try to tell patients. You, you take this blob, which I saw because my son just graduated medical school. So I look at these kids and I'm like, oh my God, you got to turn them into surgeons and OBGYNs and psychiatrists. And you have a conversation with them and they're good kids, but they're babies and you got to take them over a not too long period of time and turn them into somebody that can deal with, I see it in my son in the emergency room that comes through the door where your loved one is trying to die. Same thing with me with ob -Gen. You know, if, if you have, a, a, have bleeding after delivering a baby, you get very sick very quickly. So you have to turn that person into a surgeon. So you have to make them do surgery after surgery after surgery. There were nights when I did 15 C-sections, one after another after another. And that's the way you get good at what you're doing. But in that, we used I trained at Wake Forest. So we used to eat Krispy Kreme donuts, black coffee and Krispy Kreme donuts, which are sugar bombs to stay awake and then the, you had to work all the next day. So that's why I said it was interesting when I saw where I came in. I'm in Houston, Texas. I don't do ozone. I don't do red light therapy. I mean, I don't do, there's all these other things that a lot of these clinics do that I don't do any of that. And I, like I said, I just started doing the, the plasma. What's the story of your life? So I am a... I was brought up in New York. I grew, I grew up in New York. I'm an only child. Um, I've got a great relationship with my mom and dad. We're super, super close. And I've actually just been giving them, I give them three liters of plasma every six months. My mom and dad are uh, both still alive. And they're, and my mom will be 81 in August. My dad will be, will, will be actually, he was, no, he was 81 in January. A, a golfer, you know, a handicap is six. They're both healthy people. So I like to believe I inherited some good, strong genetics. And then I did college in, in Pennsylvania, medical school back in New York, and then my residency in Wake Forest. I do believe that my microbiome, my gut bugs really took a big hit with my New York lifestyle, right? We grew up with fluffernutter sandwiches and pop tarts and, you know, my, my mom would cook, but you know, TV dinners were coming out then and, and, and fast food. I remember the first Burger King opened in New Jersey and we used to go once a month to New Jersey to have a Whopper was a treat. So, so I grew up in that and my mom and dad both work. They're both teachers. So I grew up where, yes, I ate well, but we brought bologna sandwiches to school. What happened then medical school, again, we lived on pop tarts, I had no money. You know, you're paying your tuition, you were living in uh, to get by day to day. And then it's same thing kind of through residency. And then very interesting part of what led me into more of this lifestyle. So I'm living that lifestyle. And then I got married in residency and coming right out of residency, I got pregnant with Andy, my first son. And he was born at an uncomplicated pregnancy and uncomplicated delivery. But Andy had no language till he was about three and a half years old. I went to every doctor, no verbal language and no comprehensive language. He didn't answer to his name at 15, 18 months, nothing. And I remember one of his cousins came to visit us and at 18 months, she was a girl. I had a conversation with her and I was like, oh my God, there's something wrong with my kid. 
So we saw every doctor you can think of. I got all kinds of diagnoses. Nobody had any answer. I had barely a talking kid who started to say a few words at about three and a half. And then I had my second son, still crazy ob gin life. And Douglas didn't talk until he was close to five. At three and a half, I had him evaluated and they told me he was severely mentally retarded and would never talk, had an IQ of 47. One just graduated medical school. He's at Oshner in an, in an emergency room residency. And the other one is about to graduate with his master's from Baylor. But what took me down that pathway was with the same exact time, the Women's Health Initiative came out that said that hormones were going to give you breast cancer and kill you. So now I got miserable women in my practice. I got two non-talking kids and I was about just over 40 years old, 40, 41 years old. And there was a small compounding pharmacy next to my office who talked about bioidentical hormones and estrogen and women. And I was trying to learn a little bit from him because that was different than the Premer and the horse pee that was a problem. And I turned around and said, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm gonna hurt people. I gotta find a conference. And I Googled bioidentical hormone conference and the American Academy of Anti-Aging came up. And I actually had a patient who was a nutritionist who was interested in working part-time in my office. It was before people were really putting nutrition into any kind of doctor's offices. And we went to an American Academy of Anti-Aging functional medicine meeting. And I was introduced to the microbiome and vitamin D and food and inflammation. And it turned my world upside down. And I came home and I, I implemented that with the kids. I cleaned up everything, we got them off. And we didn't have all the testing we even have now, but I didn't care. I got them off gluten and dairy. I got them deeper into athletics. My younger one got into triathlon. My older one was playing basketball. So, so there, we were real, real focused with what their food was and slowly, but surely the language came, the kids changed. I got them on Omega. I got them on probiotics. And like I said, the one, they both graduated college. One's in his master's and the other one's in med school. So as I saw those changes and started using the bioidentical hormones with women, I saw how well they did. And then I turned 45, 46 and did started to do the micronutrient testing, realizing menopause was coming. So I did micronutrient testing. I did the gut microbiome testing. I did some of my food sensitivities. So I said, if I'm going into menopause, I'm gonna go in optimal. Meanwhile, I was running and staying fit. And then as menopause came along, I'm very, very tuned into, I do testing. I look at hormone levels. I look at tissue levels. So my estrogen now runs in a 24-hour urine at the level of somebody in their late 40s. I don't do crazy all over the place hormones, but I try to optimize the system as the system kind of tried to fail. And, and one of the things for me that I saw my kids' brains change so dramatically was because of the youthful factors, right? They say, oh, the brain can't do anything after five. No way. It was a dramatic change even through high school. But again, that youthful factor plus the exercise, the exercise upregulating the growth hormone, getting the microbiome in line, probably dropped the free radicals, which were an issue because I gave them a rotten microbiome from what I was eating as an ob resident, but it changed. And as I changed that, you saw dramatic positive effects. So the concept says, if you can do that, then why wouldn't you take young factors that are happy to be donated and then take that person with Parkinson's or Alzheimer's like what Dale Bredesen does and get them off gluten and dairy and, and get them eating cleaner and increase their vegetation and up their vitamin D and give them hormones and then give them young factors. And that's what I hope to do to help for me, rectangular is like I said, help that aging process. And if down the road more longevity comes, I think that's wonderful. That's right, that's the space that we're in now. So you brought up quite unhealthily, just a regular American family. And then you ended up having some fairly extreme career and family challenges. And then you have um, encountered longevity and, and, and that's where your head started to go up from the time. And remember, 
I never, I was never quote unquote, I was very blessed. I was never sick. Like even at the time while I was having the kid challenges before I learned about all of that, I would come home from a long day at work and I would make spaghetti, right? Or things were crazy and we would go buy McDonald's because I was on call. I was, I was like, oh my God, I got to get the kids fed so I can get them set so that I can get to the hospital. And, and when my kids were on top of all of that, when my kids were, I think Dougie was about seven or eight and Andy was 10, I got divorced. So now I'm a single mom, OBGYN, right? Tr kids with me probably 90% of the time. And you got to balance all of that. I mean, I, I remember, it was funny. I remember I had Doug at the hospital one day. The nurses were wonderful watching him. Andy was home. He was a little older. Maybe he was like 14 or 13. He was a little older. So I left him and I had to go on the, on the weekend and do an emergency C-section. And I'm in the middle of surgery and the, this patient's like uterus is on her belly and the then Andy calls and one of the nurses picks up my phone and he says, well, can you tell my mom there's water pouring out of the attic all over the house? My hot water heater exploded. So yeah, there's, there's been some, I'm like, okay, just tell him I got to finish up here, you know, try to go find one of our neighbors to, to maybe turn the water to the house off. But yeah, there's been quite a few challenges, but maybe some of it I like to believe is attitude, right? Keep going forward. And that's some of what marathon running and, and athletics has taught me. And, and that's why, again, I'm very pro exercise because when you can push through things like that, you can push through anything. You, you give me a bit of fear there because so my partner is having a baby, baby in, in two months. Do you actually have some, some advice for me? What should I do? How should I? So the biggest thing that I can tell you is that Things get difficult at the end of pregnancy because you're just tired all the time. You don't feel good, right? So it's it's hard on your partner and 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 they're trying to do their to live their life and then it's hard on you and you you kind of never you don't know what to do. You do the best you can to be supportive, but it's like nothing makes them happy. So the biggest thing is is make sure that you do everything you can that her food is good and that her brain is calm because that's epigenetically, right, everything we look at, that transfers into the baby. It was really interesting. I did a sort of my own little study when I was still delivering babies, where when we were looking at telomeres, when we used to think that telomeres were the big key to how long your telomeres are to how long you're going to live. And what I did is I had five patients that I knew very well. And at labor, I did the telomere length and the micronutrients on mom and then in the delivery, whether it was a C-section or a vaginal delivery, I did the telomere length and the micronutrients on the baby, on the cord blood to try to see. And I found it very interesting. There was no real correlation. The only thing I found is that, yeah, you would have terrible nutrients in mom and really good nutrients in the baby. It was, it was pretty fascinating. The more stressed though, that I saw the mom and dad kind of argue and the more I knew mom's diet was off, the shorter the telomeres were in the baby. So there's a big pass on, I think, of that epigenetic stress and we know that, but I, I saw it in the kids. Number two, most of the babies had very low glutathione. So, so glutathione writes a massive antioxidant, I think like 60 or 70% of the, of the cord blood babies had low glutathione. And I think because cave baby is not supposed to be exposed to the toxic soup, right? Think about it. You're born, you're in the cave, mom protects it. Kind of like the Lion King, right? You know, she takes care of Simba in the little cave. And that's why I think my kids had the issues they had. So I, I gave them not a great microbiome because my own gut bugs were terrible at the time, which I didn't realize. And then you got to really be careful. I think it's important to watch what they put in their mouth because their ability to fight the free radicals is compromised. That's just how they're born. And remember, microbiome forms in the first three years. So we don't think about that as much, especially when we're on our second and third kid, but even from the first one. So it's important that you, you know, we gave, I gave the baby kids a lot of juice. We give them apple juice. We give them, and I'm not saying you got to breastfeed exclusively. Breastfeeding is good, but the American Academy of Pediatrics says breastfeed for a year. Some people just can't. I couldn't. I breastfed a few months. It's just, it's just my milk dried up because I went back to work. But, but I think 
to do the best he can to to make sure that baby gets outside and gets good circadian rhythm sunshine. Get up in the morning even if the baby's outside for five or ten minutes. Set up the circadian rhythm. Make sure again that the food that you use really look at the formula. Making your own baby food is very difficult, but really look at the formula. Um, if you if you can't breastfeed, when you move to regular food, make sure that you know just the baby crackers and all that stuff stay away from. I would talk to pediatric pediatricians. They'll tell you to supplement with probiotics. They'll tell you to supplement with a little vitamin D. So I think building that baseline in that baby, the gut and the, the health and lowering again, the cost of doing business. That's what it's all about. Everything is physics. If you do that, I think you'll enable, right? Less gut brain axis inflammation. That's where I think my kids became dyslexic. So that those free radicals, the brain couldn't form itself. So therefore the nerve endings became a little bit of an issue. So the more you kind of lower that cost of doing business, I think the healthier you'll be, your baby will do great. All right. Well, good nutrition and calm mind. And interesting, if you really listen to even the aging gurus, right? Even Brian Johnson, who's measuring, you know, everything he possibly can. If you listen to him on podcasts now, his five pillars are, I think, like diet, exercise, sleep, nutrition, and I can't remember the last one, but it's the pillars that we've always talked about. Morgan Levine wrote True Age, right? She's kind of the big epigenetic person from Yale that's now at Altos Labs. Her book says the same thing, diet, exercise, stress, relief, and sleep. Can I challenge you on that? Yeah. Um, just yesterday, I had a conversation with Jeffrey Gladden, and he had a very interesting notion that aging is an exponential problem. And yet we are attacking it with linear solutions and the linear solutions are diet, exercise and sleep, right? So if we would have exponential solutions, now well, that would be that thing, do you think? Correct, correct. I'm just saying the only thing I can see in that thing now, and I know Jeffrey Gladden very pretty well, the difference is, is what is that exponential thing? And for me, understanding, and I'm not a PhD in physics, but everything you read is that, that aging follows the second world of thermodynamics. I mean, the second law of thermodynamics. It's no different than your car. When you drive that car for the first couple years, you don't have a problem. But as you beat those molecules down more, you exponentially blow your car up because you can't recover it as well. Right, the engine is not quite as smooth. The battery doesn't run quite as well. The brakes then cause a little bit more wear and tear. It's the same concept in everything. Key is then what can you do to slow that ball from rolling down the hill as it picks up faster? That's where I think the young factors come in. Because you can take that machine, my body, and you can run ozone through or red light or cold plunge or, how, or whatever they do in the, even peptides, you're going to heal, but you can, you can only heal what your body can do. So the key, when you get to that point, how you're exponentially helping is you're turning around and going, ah, the extracellular matrix, which is the blood supply. If you read Leonard Hayflick's papers, right? The Hayflick limit, he'll tell you the number one thing that goes in aging is the vascular system. And one of the reasons that happens is the vascular system, the blood vessels are surrounded by an extracellular matrix. And that's what keeps it pliable. And as you get older, advanced glycation products and metalloproteinases, garbage gets in there, which stiffens it. And then the microvascular doesn't, vasculature doesn't work. A lot of the literature will tell you we die with stem cells, right? The stem cells are there. We can't get to them. Women are a very good example of that because there's estrogen beta receptors in the blood vessel. So what happens to women, we do great if you don't take hormones until your estrogen drops. That's why heart disease goes up in women as they get older because you're losing that vascular concept, that, that pliability. So if you can't make it, no matter what you throw at that person, what you have to do, it's just like hormone replacement. You've got to replace it. You've got to replace the battery. You've got to replace the shock absorbers. So linearly, it's not about, to me, shifting the genes around because the gene's going to go, I'm doing the best I can. 
the molecules aren't here. I, I can't do it anymore. I can't make those reactions. So when you put the young proteins back in, that's why if you look at like the presentation I did at RADFest where our data was there, you'll see that heart failure got better. Why? Because the fibrosis in the heart, now you're regenerating some of that tissue because you're adding from the outside world things that the body couldn't make. That's where the plasma answer comes in. You're giving those molecules back. Why is it just plasma? Why, why not blood? Because you don't need those. The, the, and blood is, a, is more harsh on the system because the reactivity is higher. But you don't need those cells because, again, you have marrow. You have efficiency that you can make those blood cells. Where the real problem is, is everything in the plasma. You have dopamine and acetylcholine <clears throat> and all those precursors from a young microbiome. You have exosomes. People are out taking these placental exosomes, which I think is a huge mistake because did you, nobody looked. It goes exactly to what I said about OBGYN. You don't know if that mom had blood pressure, preeclampsia, fighting with the husband, growth restriction from the baby. You get a placenta and you don't know what mom put into that. Whereas from the, the mature, the exosomes they take out of that, they're signaling molecules. Signaling what? As you get older, you can't receive the signal anymore because the other molecules go away. So it's the exosomes are in the plasma, but so are the peptides, so are the young microbiome products, so are all the healthy molecules that can replace those glycation products. All of those things that are in that young system that heal that young system. Look at the marathon runners, right? The Kenyans. Those guys are so efficient. So you get a machine that is efficient and it then produces all these wonderful things and you watch how fast the body moves. That's what you're doing from the kids that donate plasma. They're healthy, they're fit, they go through all kinds of screening, all kinds of testing, and their protein levels are good, their, their numbers are all good, and then they're volunteer. They give you those products that help your body continue to function, just like changing the battery in your car. Plasma is important from another point of view as well, because there is a theory and I, I, I think I, I got the debunking of it, but uh, please reflect if I'm, I'm right or wrong on this, I want to understand. So there is a theory that uh, using young, I'm going to say blood, is cheating on the rejuvenation Olympics because you put young blood and then they are taking the blood and measuring that. However, if I understand it correctly, they are measuring the white blood cells and, and, and there is no blood, but only the plasma part of the blood, right? So in that case, it, the, the, the cheating just doesn't happen at all because plasma goes in and white blood cells are measured, right? Correct. Right. And, and I told you I had plasma. I don't know how much the plasma affected me because I had the plasma in 2018. And my three rejuvenation numbers were like 2019, 20 or, or 20, 21 and 23. But um, but yeah, it's I don't I don't think you could say it's it's not like you're putting a young blood cell in and then taking that young blood cell out and saying, oh, you know, this is my 59 year old blood cell. You're, you're putting the bath in, right? You're, you're bathing my white cells and my tissues and my blood vessels with all the proteins and the exosomes and all that. And that is creating, and I even have my own thoughts about whether plasma affects epigenetics negatively in terms of reflecting what the state of your body is because you have to think about it this way too if if your genes look down the road and they go hey i don't see enough of this to make my red blood cells or to make my my vascular tree your gene if it was smart would upregulate right the methylation would change so the gene could make this lining and keep this blood vessel healthy. But if you put young factors in and the gene looks down and goes, dude, I don't have to do anything because all these factors are here, save it. You may find that methylation 
looks worse. You're blocking it. You're, you're less efficient appearing in your genes when you add the young plasma. So I don't even know that the testing reflects it 100%. That's part of what I'm researching now. But it's enough to work as hard because you've replaced this here. So I don't right. know in the long run that the, the, the pace of aging is the be all end all, that epigenetics is the be all end all because there's so many things that can affect it. And then True Diagnostic then came out with their omic test that they said is even better. And it, it doesn't even, for me, it doesn't even correlate with my, my Dunedin pace of aging. Because it's saying, oh, mm -hmm. and my age, I'm pacing, aging so slow. Well, why am I only then, that it said I'm only aging better than 19% of people in my age group. So I, well, I think the testing is still, way we don't know if you're looking at the mathematics it is not impossible right because pace of aging is 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 a different metric than biological ages right because pace of aging is is like this and biological aging is like that but what if your pace of aging just goes like this for 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 one day then your biological age can go up like crazy and you, you know like, you had to do three you had to do three tests that's why the rejuvenation Olympics is three tests. Because if there was a zebra in there, you would look like I was 0 0.8, 0 0.7, 0 0.7 over my three months. I mean, uh, well, you should uh, be testing tests. every day. Yeah. So there's a paper that, that <laughs> I just saw that said that epigenetic age varies up to two to three years throughout the day. Mm -hmm. So so that's why I'm saying I, I think that there are things that we need to think about that relate to this that say, wait a minute, what I'm putting all this stuff in here, then these guys just don't have to work that hard. So you may see methylation changes based on all this stuff you're putting in the body. And I just think that's something that people haven't considered when looking at that as a testing modality, when you're adding um, so much new stuff in. Even if you assume that uh, uh, these epigenetic aging crocs are perfect, then even if you assume that we we, we still have a problem there, a correlation causation problem, although it's debatable that causation, even a thing, a phenomenon that exists, but uh, anyhow, correlation is not causation, but that's quite 100%. a hint. Now, 100%. What do it's you think about it. that? How much does, does it make sense to optimize for epigenetic ages? And are we just, are we going to make a, make a sizable difference in aging or we, we just don't know how, how deep the epigenetic age is there? Yes, it's exactly what you just said, because there are papers out there that basically say that, that the, like the Alzheimer's predisposition or the Parkinson's predisposition is on these genes, but epigenetics, this is what changes. Right. The whole key is to, for me, to try to avoid disease as much as possible, right? To rectangularize our age so we can be as healthy as we can, as long as we can until our time comes. But if, 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 so then if you're saying that aging is where disease comes in, then logic would say, okay, well, I want to follow this epigenetic change because when this goes here, this gene goes bad, but the genes that are creating the problem are not always related to the epigenetic changes. So yes, there is correlation more than causation, but that's because where it's coming from is the data that's chosen, right? So for Dunedin pace of aging, like, like, and I don't really understand this, and I've, I've talked to Ryan at True Diagnostic about it. When they did the Dunedin pace of aging, one of the, the they used a bunch of markers, right? They correlated the methylation to a bunch of, of real markers. Well, one of the markers that they used is the LP little a. And the theory is, is the LP little a, if you have inflammation issues and plaques in your system, the LP little a can make your plaque worse, which can increase your risk of heart disease. So I got dinged for the LP little a because I have it, but my total cholesterol and my triglycerides and my LDL and my VLDL are all really good. So my LP little a is walking around going, okay, you know, whatever, I've got no, <laughs> I see reactive protein's normal. There's, you know, is there anybody, like a bully can't do anything if he doesn't have kids behind him. So, so I think that's problem number one, that, that what they're picking to correlate it to is an issue. 
Number two, what they just did with the most recent omics age, from my understanding, and and again, uh, this is not my complete space, but but I try to understand it all, is they've correlated it to medical record outcomes. So they they looked at the methylation, then they looked at, that's where the Harvard data came from, then they looked at the actual data, and then they looked at the patient outcome. So if your hemoglobin A1C, you know, your prediabetes marker was up, how does that correlate with methylation and then when did you die and so that's what they're what they're correlating so that again the question is 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 it correlation that way and then they're going well therefore if you look like this that group of people died younger so you want to look like this group of people I don't know how much you can say that's the same as well if your blood pressure is 190 over 110 you're with that stroke group rather than the healthier group. I don't know the answer to that, and I don't know that anybody does. It's just the best we have now. Well, it's good enough to have some nice conversations. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and some fun with the, with the new sport that's yes. being created. <laughs> yes. Um, I would like to talk a bit more about you. Uh, so let's switch gears a bit. I would like to talk about what's in here, uh, what's out there, and what's in here. So... Firstly, are you spiritual? Yes, and the older I am, the more I am. I'm fascinated with Donald Huffman and uh, and the concepts of what are reality. You know, the that are we living in a virtual reality? Like I, the the mathematics behind that. I, I'm pretty fascinated by that. Uh, who's another one? Rupert Sheldrake, kind of the electrical system of sort of what everything is and and what is consciousness. I don't know, but I do think that the kind of electrical impulses that we are will sort of guide us in our health and and interrelationships that we have, you know, with those around us. And what do I think God is? I don't know, but I think there is some group consciousness that is creating all that we are. Tell me more about that. I don't know. I wish I had more time to sit and read it. Right. I wish I had more time to sit and read and learn about it. I try to read the books as much as possible. I, like I said, I listen to those guys on YouTube, but the concept of what is the world, right? That, that the energetics come in and our brain creates our reality. And, and it kind of makes a little bit of sense because, right? Because if you believe that, then you can see the world coming at you as positive or negative. And if you try to keep that, I think that that keeps a very, upbeat, if you would, electrical energy. And if you want to call that your spirituality, then it's probably a little bit of one in the same. And it, mm. it helps, I think, for me, I'm very, very close to my mom and dad. And where a lot of this, I think I've gotten away more from the practicality, the ob the 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 day-to-day -day pounding into more of that thought process is as I watch my parents age. And I think, you know, you know what I mean? You turn around and you say, okay, there's a practicality of I'm going to give them young plasma and I've got them on vitamins and I'm doing what I can, but, but my folks aren't going to live forever. And we have to be able to cope with horrible things that happen in the world and things that happen in our life. And I want to be able to feel that everything all is one. So when something does happen and my parents do go, I can move forward. It's one thing to deal with your death and the events leading up to your death, but it's almost a completely different thing to deal with the death of others. Yes. And my <laughs> death, I wouldn't have an issue with, except my kids need me. One of the things that helps me is my dad is just an amazing guy. And he goes, Diane, I love you, but when I die, not my problem. So, so it's comical and I try to keep that close to my heart. So when it comes again, I have the spiritual connection, but I have the visual, my dad going, you know, kind of not my problem. So, so it's using the tools we have to find that balance. What's your tribe? You have your family. You have your colleagues. Uh, who are the people you spend the most uh, time with? I am a, I think, real introvert. And so I find it very difficult to make small talk, like to just kind of go socially. 
So I've got two very close girlfriends that sometimes I'll go months that I won't see, but you know, they'll check in and go, you just kind of make sure I'm still alive. And, uh, and I, I, they will be there till the end. I really relate like not only running, but I, I belong to a small gym that's family owned that I started working out pretty regularly about two and a half years ago. And they're great people. And now that I'm training for the Spartan race, I'm, I hang out with a, a guy that did American Ninja Warrior who's been training me. So I really, those are the people that I love and I bond to probably because athletics are so important to me that that's where the common ground is. But I'm okay alone. I spend a, quite a bit of time just, like I said, running on my own. And a lot of times when I run, like I love animals. So I'll run through the park and feed the ducks, even though the sign says don't feed the wildlife. I carry duck food in my back, my uh, my running bag. So, so my tribe is probably those around my physical fitness that I kind of come and go with. But I'm probably a pretty introverted on my own person. If I have downtime, I'd like to read theory, theory, spiritual Not theory, fiction. No. And I'm very, very, I'm working now on integrating some AI support into the menopause world. The big problem with, with aging females is the lack of understanding of, you know, they go to their doc and their doctor tells them, well, if you don't feel bad, you don't need hormones. The understanding in that space is zero. So AI to me is a wonderful tool that you can get data into, that you can create some interaction with women so they can get educated as they go through perimenopause and menopause and entering into that as a new, hey, I'm taking, this is just a new part of my life. My kids are gone and I'll see them here and there, but but this is my time to be me and giving them strength and the tools and the understanding of how to take that next step healthy. I spend a lot of time researching so I can put together that AI bot that will really be supportive. All right, Just don't tell Elon Musk. In a good way, in a good way, <laughs> because I'm gonna feed it. I'm gonna feed it with my info. That's, oh, yeah, so, yeah. that's the big difference. So, so I get the whole, and I agree with where he is with that, but I think uh, that doctor time with with patients is very limited and i think to be able to have the doctor have a little extension of himself or herself of their information can be invaluable to patients i am a software developer and i was thinking about of course every software developer in this world is thinking about ai bots right i kept myself away from this to an extent from a programming of course i did some programming but I kept myself away because I just realized that there is a new thing every single day. And it's like, if I learn this API, then I am going to this. My knowledge gets obsoleted so fast that I have to switch to the other one. Um, are you, are you, are you doing GPT? Are you building on GPT-4? That I can't answer because I'm the nutty professor. So I've got, in other words, I, I have the data because I've done so much YouTube, so much research. So I'm the nutty professor that can put it down into writing. I've got people that know way more than I do about oh. that, that are doing the bot stuff. I wanna bring the info that that lady who says, I haven't had a period for six months and now I'm bleeding, you know, is that a problem? Like that, that that's what comes up or, or, or is it normal that I've gained kind of this 15 pounds or, well, now I can't sleep at night, but I don't know if I need hormones. I don't want the AI bot to give medical advice, but there are things that it can do to say, yeah, you know, this can be normal. Here's some ways you can detox or here's some, those are things that'll kind of put functional medicine and longevity from, again, I don't want it to be a doctor, but a support system that she's not reading, reading, reading. Because women are not gonna, people are too busy to do that. They want a little interaction. And then I'm gonna let the people that are building the platform it on make that happen. Well, in case this longevity thing doesn't work out, we're still gonna have you as a, <laughs> as a virtual <laughs> self. We'll see. I don't know if that's good or bad. All right. So tell me about a day in your life. A typical day in your life, what happens? So, um, so lately it's my, it's been a little crazier because I'm training for the Spartan 10 K. So it's a, 
10K race with, I think, 25 obstacles, and I'm trying to get my upper body stronger. So what I will usually do is I'll get up usually about 5, 5.30, and um, I to my local gym at... Well, when do you sleep? When do you go to sleep? I go to bed early. I go to bed by 9. I sleep 8 hours, 8.30 to 9. And, mm -hmm. I, and I'm really... I do. I'm a, I'm a big Matthew Walker fan. He's the PhD in sleep that, that really talks about, you know, sleep hygiene. And, and I really respect that. Like I, I don't watch TV in bed. You know, I go up, I may read a little bit of a book. I always tell my patients and I do don't read a fiction book, right? Read something that kind of taxes the brain a little to fatigue you and, and have your essential oils. So, so things that really make you calm. So I do respect that 10, 15, 20 minute in bed before I go to bed. And then I get, I try to get eight hours sleep. I told you I don't deliver babies anymore. So I'm up about 5, 15, 5, 20, something like that. I'm usually to the gym by 10 after six. My workout there's about an hour and a half. I do the Versa climber. So I do cardio and then I do weights. Some days I'll go out, I'll get up and I'll do like a, maybe an eight mile run before work. And then um, three days a week, I see patients all day. Two days a week, I see patients only 12 to five because in the morning, I'm usually, that's when I do research, some of the research when my brain is fresh and I can think. And then in the afternoon now at, at six to seven, a few days a week, I either aqua jog. And then the other days I've been training with Sam San, who's a, a ninja kind of a ninja king. He was a champion on American Ninja Warrior. So Sam Stan has a gym in Houston. So I've been going to Sam's gym and he's been doing lessons with me to to teach me to, to kind of ride, do the rings and ride the obstacles better and, and build my strength. And and I, I generally only eat about two meals a day because I'm not real hungry in the morning. My food is pretty clean. My carbohydrates are sweet potato or white potato or butternut squash. I do track my protein. So I do, you know, my weight divided. So I use divided by the 2.2 times 1.5. So I do a bit of protein and a protein drink through that. And then I try to make sure I get enough protein through the day. And I try to get two to three cups of vegetables. I'd love to get more uh, or four cups of vegetables in a day on a good day, a day that I'm not super hungry, maybe only two, two and a half. And then I, I, the best thing you can do, and I just can't always do it. And I tell my patients, you have to give yourself some grace, right? You don't want to eat two hours before you go to bed. But sometimes when my workout, if I'm done with patients and my workout is later, if I don't get home until seven, seven thirty, and I eat and then I go to bed at nine, it's not optimal, but I do what I can. Right. And I, and again, I have to give myself a little bit of grace. And I, so I try to eat up? a bigger meal. Say that again. But you still wake up yeah. when you don't get, uh, yeah. 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 So like I said, I try to, I try to do the best I can to balance what I can while giving myself grace if it doesn't work out perfect that day. That's that's very intense routine there. Yeah, a little bit. And then I'll do a little bit less. Like I may not do as much at night after the race, give myself a couple of weeks to recover. But even then, I love to run. I love to lift. And I think, you know, it's less intense because I it's a sedentary lifestyle, right? I mean, seeing patients whether you're in person or on the computer or, or doing research, you're still sitting still. And I have a standing desk. It helps me because I fidget a little bit. But if you realistically think about it, you sleep eight hours and you work eight or nine hours behind your desk, you're spending a ton of time doing nothing. So it sounds like a lot to get up and exercise for an hour in the morning and at night, but it's really not. Cause, cause you would have done so much more in caveman times. And even if people don't want to go to the gym and swing from the bars, you have to do strength. And then at the end of the day, then it, if nothing else, take yourself out for a 30, 40 minute walk. But most people they're they'll, Oh, that's so much. But again, if you really look at your day, even if you're running errands or you're run, you're busy, you're still sitting, you're driving your car, you're running. We do, we live a very sedentary lifestyle we go to the grocery store you know we don't pick our own food so we we really don't do that much physical activity even though we go oh i've had a long day and i try to get people to kind of see that perspective have you heard of gtg leaving the crew with some uh, russian technique where a uh, workout technique where you work out throughout the day 
but uh, in small doses. So there is no, not specifically there, but I know that they have like the scientific seven minute workout. And they'll say, even if you do seven minutes, you know, you do like jumping jacks for 30 seconds and then they give you a five second rest and then you do wall sit. I mean, even that to do twice a day, I, I don't think people have to do my regimen. I happen to, that's my happy place. It's easier now because my kids are grown. I know it's harder on somebody that's got kids that, you know, have to get off to school. I did the best I could when my kids were here and I would get up early and I would just kind of run the neighborhood to do, you know, to marathon train or, or put weights in my garage apartment. But I think that I'm good with the shorter stuff. If longer makes you happy, I'm fine. As long as you keep perspective and move your body. People just talk about doing something a couple times a day is a lot. And I just think the reality is that most of our days are very sedentary or minimal, pushing the shopping cart around this store. So I, I think if you look at it in that perspective, moving that body and getting that heart rate up is healthy and probably what you were paleolithically designed for. Right. And what environment are you are you are you doing all this in? Like um, air purifiers, uh, circadian lighting, uh, nature. Uh, what, what what environment did you create for yourself? So I do nothing fancy in my house. I have a Berkey, which is a little water purifier. It's Berkey filter. It's this gray thing with filters on it. So I drink my water out of that. And then I don't like, I don't have any air purifiers. I don't have any fancy lights or anything. The gym is inside. I like nature. So like I said, my long runs are through the park, but sometimes if it's the end of the day, my long run is on the streets. So I'd, I'd love to say that I have time to sit in nature and you know kind of really appreciate all of that there's very little time for that during the week so sometimes i'll just sit outside and i live in a it's 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 a community like i, I live in in houston i'm not in houston proper but it's not like i live on three acres of farmland you know what i mean where i can go sit in the grass so we're kind of the the space is a lot of concrete in my neighborhood it's just a suburban neighborhood So I, I try, like I, I try to plant, I think that's really nice. Like I, I, I don't have a huge backyard, but I, I try to create positive flowers, like different flower co colors. And even if I do it at Home Depot, right? I don't have to go to a fancy nursery, but I try to keep some flowers around and then that brings the butterflies around and that brings the squirrels around. So, so I think it's as much as I can get of being part of everything. You know, if a monarch butterfly flies by, it's it's a good day. I always feel right. like I'm lucky that day or a dragonfly. Well, let's let's talk a bit more about your diet. So you pay attention to your protein intake, you pay attention to your vegetable food intake. How strict are you with all this? And is there other staple principles that you follow here? other than protein and vegetable. I found that that I grew up on a lot of, I hate to say junk food, but I grew up on a lot of that. And I found that as I, I mean, Yankee Doodles and Twinkies, I love that stuff. And, and we're made to love that stuff, right? But I found <laughs> as I've pulled it out of my diet, when I started to clean everything up and learn about this in my mid 40s, I found that my desire for it really went down. So, so, Probably the biggest thing I'll do is, is like an oat bar. Like I can't, I can't do a 10 mile run on no carbs. Some people can. So I'll try to do a clean oat bar or a, you know, like a, a reasonable bar that I'll take two or three bites of just to put a little glucose in my system. I use the goo gel on a long run. It's got a little sugar in it, you know, to kind of keep it up. So that's like the typical athlete. We take salt, we take that just to get through the run. But other than that, my carbohydrates are really all vegetables. I don't like gluten-free pasta. I, if I have to, I'll eat it. But, but it's really, again, I eat parsnips. I, I eat a lot of sweet potatoes and white potatoes and purple potatoes. And, and I try to shop. When I do shop, I try to shop with my phone. So if I, if I look at something, we've got a couple of stores. We've got a store in Houston called Central Market, and they have weird stuff. So I shop with my phone and if I'll see like, oh, sea beans, I've never seen that before. So I Google, how do you eat sea beans? And then the, the comes up, you know, cut it into pieces and put it in a pot. So I, I know the number one thing for health is microbiome diversity. 
And the number one way to get your microbiome diverse is to vary your plants. That comes from the PhDs in microbiology. So I try to eat weird as much as I can. I'm, I, you know, sometimes I'll look and I'm like, oh my God, they want 59.99 for this for a pound. I mean, I, I think that's a little extreme, but as long as it's reasonable, I'm like, oh, I've never had a quince before. So I Google that and they go put it on top of a pork chop. So my kids will tell you the same thing. Every once in a while, like I, I make them in the fall when they're visiting, I buy cranberry, like little dried cranberries, and I'll put that in the, in the salad. And my, my sons will go, oh my God, these are bitter. I'm like, it's good for you, eat it. It's good to be a little bitter. So I, I really try to eat for my microbiome diversity as much as I possibly can. And there's all kinds of weird stuff around and you just Google what it is and sometimes I destroy it when I cook it and sometimes it's not wonderful but edible but I'm fairly technical probably with food I'm one of those people that if if I didn't have to eat I wouldn't that food is fuel and so because I look at it that way it's easy for me to not eat any more cake or cookies or anything like that and I I love the athletic part of my life so much that I, I feel so, I, and I feel so strong about my body. And I was very, very, one of the things I didn't tell you is that in 2018, I was training for my third Ironman to try to go to Kona because I was, I think, sixth in my age group in Ironman, Mar in Ironman Maryland. And I wanted to try to go to Kona. I was going to do Ironman Cozumel to try and get better on the bike. And I was pushing the bike and I was still delivering babies. And uh, I was, my, was trying to get one kid into college and one kid into medical school. And uh, I woke up one day and I had a blood pressure of 180 over one, a oh. terrible headache. And I said to one of the girls in my office, can you take my blood pressure? And they, that's what it was. And I went to the hospital and I was admitted to the emergency room and, you know, the, my pressure and the IV and all that. And then I was convinced I went through a horrible, probably almost year, blood pressure meds. And then thinking that I have a tumor on my adrenal glands and, because it would come out of nowhere. And it turned out it was just a real dysregulated, stressed out system. So I'm, I'm really respectful now for health until you've been through a bad health scare, like I'm fine now. Um, but until you've been through a real bad health scare, you don't appreciate your health. So that's why I said I, I will never go back because I know what it's like to be sick. And I, I eat for my health now, scientifically. I eat for my body. I eat because I'm so blessed to be able to run and to be able to be outside and, and do all those things that I don't ever want to be that person that gets wheeled off the airplane or, or is, is in that hospital bed. And I know eventually it happens, but my, my food is to fuel my healthy machine. What about pills? How many pills do you take? Day. So I probably take, and I'm, I, I kind of fluctuate in and out depending upon marathon, long distance stuff. So I, like my patients, I tell them I take omega, vitamin D, and a probiotic, and those guys are pretty non-negotiable. Orthomolecular. What kind of probiotic? Sorry, so, I, I, I couldn't decide for myself, so I just took a general one. So I asked um, Dr. Williams, who's the microbiology PhD. Uh, for orthomolecular, which is, you know, a multi-billion dollar company. And they make spores and they make a regular probiotic. So I asked him, figuring that guy knows a little bit about everything. He said that there's no spores in our body, naturally, and that basically most of the makeup is different lactobacillus and bifidobacter. Yeah. And that when the body gets out of whack, what will happen is, is your C. diff can overgrow. So Saccharomyces boulardii eats that back down again. So everybody's like, oh, should you rotate your probiotics? What should you do? But if you really take a good quality probiotic, right? Let's say there's 10 companies. You, I'm not, you've got to be very careful what you buy off the shelf. But you know you're buying from a good quality company. If you read the back of all the probiotics, they're basically the same. They've got lactobacillus strains. They've got bifidobacter strains. Like I said, orthomolecular and their orthobiotic, they add Saccharomyces boulardii. I know I think uh, a company just came out with Ackermansia and that's supposedly Ackermansia um, by itself supposedly helps the GLP. So for people that are struggling with weight, they're saying that's a GLP activator, you know, people that, that, that can't lose weight. So that may have its niche, but I think as long as you're using a good quality company, remember, and this is what I learned from the, the microbiology guys, the bugs aren't doing much. The bugs that you take are wimpy little guys that have been grown in a garden. 
the bacteria that are in your gut are like wolves, whereas the guy in your pill is a chihuahua. So they're related, <laughs> but distant. So what happens is the chihuahua dude comes down and the wolves are all over the place. The big thing that happens is the immune system in the small intestine says, who are you and why are you here? The Im it wakes your immune system up. So now the immune system can go, and by the way, let me get those wolves back in line. So as your own keystone bacteria and opportunistic guys and the bad dudes that are always trying to come through, as they get out of whack, it's your immune system that needs to keep you balanced. So really mostly what your probiotics are doing is waking up your immune system more than actually bringing bugs down to do anything. That's why even people that go to Walmart and take, you know, over the, they'll take just basic probiotics and go, oh, I felt a little better. Because even the dead guys freak out the immune system and it reorganizes <laughs> the gut. So I don't recommend you going to the Walmart wall or the, you know, the, the get, go to a good company, Designs for Health, Orthomolecular, Metagenics, you know, a reasonable company, a pure encapsulation, Zymogen. So whatever you, you each person particularly trusts in that company seed probiotics but i'm but in under, eastern europe i'm gambling on all this <laughs> well so you just go to a company that you know has got kind of a pharmaceutical grade that they say they've been stamped by somebody that says the stuff in your pill is not salt mm. so so that i take that and then I take a multivitamin that's made by, by a company that's got just a bunch of bees, a bunch of good minerals in it, and it's got a bunch of antioxidants. And so it's in a powder. So because I do the protein powder, I do a, a, a low pasteurized whey protein, and then I put some of the mitocor in that also. And so that's, but, but it's a powder. So I guess you could, if you were gonna take it in a pill, they, they, they sell a product with pills. It's like four pills, like a good multi. But I just drink that after my workout. And then I take what I think is a really good idea is I take proteases. So as we get older, pr it's protease, P-R-O-T-E-A-S-E. -E. So a protease is almost like like um, that product that they used to make, the Roomba. You know that, that, that guy that goes on the floor, the vacuum that just kind of goes around and sweeps everything up? They call it a Roomba. Well, that's kind of what the protease is. Your body makes them and they naturally go around the gut and clean up the mess. Because, you know, eating is so traumatic. It rips your gut lining, it upregulates the immune system. Bacteria die. When bacteria die, their toxins come out all over, right? That's why when, when we talk about leaky gut, we'll tell people, they're like, oh, I don't have a problem with gluten. But, but gluten is a foreign object and the immune system doesn't recognize it. So you may not necessarily have celiac, but when you eat that, you create an inflammatory reaction. And so everybody does. So now you're killing bacteria and you've got toxins a little bit everywhere. So at the end of the meal, no matter what you eat, it's like somebody just threw confetti all over. And when that stuff sits there, it gets infected. And that's what creates problems with the gut lining and leaky gut and all that stuff that we hear about. So what the proteases do that your body naturally makes is they come down and they clean up the mess. They Roomba up the mess. The problem is, is they're very expensive for your body to make. They require a lot of ATP and a lot of energy. And we know as you get older, all the efficiency of everything goes down and your ability to make those proteases decreases. So I take two protease on an empty stomach in the morning and at night to help kind of clean up my gut as much as possible. And that's it. And I take some magnesium to help me sleep. I wait, take wait, a little magnesium to help me sleep. But I take but, estrogen and progesterone. I take bioidentical hormones. I take a good dose of biased and I take 150 milligrams of slow release progesterone at night. Okay, so vitamin D, fish oil, uh, probiotics. Pro it's pretty much a multivitamin, antioxidant and protease. Okay, that's, that's, that's not a big step there. Oh, um, yeah. It's a decent I, yeah. one, but not huge. <laughs> no, no, I don't. And I've seen that. Like, like there are people that stack tons and tons. Yeah, no. Because then I think what happens is then they, the average person, you, you try to give them that and then they're so sick on pills, they're not eating real food. 
The key is to get fiber in and to eat real food and then to turn around and say, okay, like if I move to Alaska. take fiber supplements as well. <laughs> why would you do that? Eat a string bean, right? If I moved to Canada, I wouldn't take fish oil because I would, or Alaska, I should say, I would eat halibut and salmon. So I really encourage people and I try to do the same thing to just to eat food. Get your fiber from your cauliflower. Do you do anything extra, like something that other people don't usually do? Hyperbaric, sir, uh, other than the blood plasma. Not at all. I wish I did. I don't have time. I always say that I've got my What kids. Are you just, I, I've got two kids. Andy is just finished up. He's in residency and Dougie's finishing up graduate school. So uh, I would like a sauna, an infrared sauna. So as the I used to say, half my sauna was in one kid's school and half was in the other. So as the boys have now finished out up everything and starting to live on their own, I may treat myself to an infrared sauna. That would be the only thing that I would like to add to my regimen in my house. All right. Is there any athlete that you know on the Rejuvenation Olympics leaderboard? So I know Brian Johnson and I know Jeff Gladden. You know them, not just uh, heard about them? No, I know them. I, ah, Jeff okay. Gladden, I, right. I, I was on Gladden's podcast talking about the plasma and um, he was at Radfest, and I know Brian Johnson personally through different reasons, but I know him not just, hey, I know of him, but I know him. Right, well, what is it that very few people agree with you on, but you strongly believe to be the case? That's an interesting question. What a few, probably, probably the big thing I would say would be the benefits that the plasma has for the aging population, depending on how old you are. I think a lot of people think that the plasma is vampire-y, you know, <laughs> torturing kids. And because of the story that came behind it with Jesse Carmazian and, and all of that that happened in the past, and it, it, it hasn't been looked at really clearly again and everybody else is just keeps hanging it on the rats which i don't understand why nature journal just keeps coming out with and we gave it to the rats and we gave it to the rats and we gave it to the rats so i think that the plasma has huge benefit for neurodegenerative disease and and people don't they don't see that for real neurodegenerative disease the neurologists and the you know, the neuroscientists to me should be giving it to all their patients. I mean, you have Parkinson's, but there's very little, they're like, no, it's snake oil. It's not working. The key to making money is fixing someone else's problem. Yes. What problems do you fix for others? Why should people give you money? Because I think there are very few people that know how to manage hormone replacement and menopause than I do. What I know, I know. What I don't know, I don't know. But I can tell you that I know and I can read perimenopause through menopause. And I think that there's women that are really start to struggle younger with hormone fluctuations. And they go to their OB-GYN who is not trained to read the labs. And not that I even got trained in it, but I've looked at thousands of labs. And there's a lot of subtleties that will change that you can see in a lab profile that is not picked up by a typical doctor. And that woman is miserable and she's in her 40s and her, her, her late 40s or her early 40s and she's still having normal cycles and she's got heart palpitations and she doesn't sleep well and she doesn't feel good and she goes to her classic doc and he just says, oh, you need Prozac, oh, you need Paxil, oh, you need an antidepressant, oh, you need a sleeping pill. I had another lady who's in and out of the cardiologist's office with heart palpitations because that's what happens when estrogen fluctuates. And then the cardiologist says, there's nothing wrong with you. Now this lady sits at home and she's a mess. She doesn't feel good. She's not herself. Her husband goes, what's wrong with you? She's impatient with her kids. And every time she goes to the doc, they say your labs are normal. If you look at, you can look at salivary levels, you look at urine levels, you look at blood levels. If you really evaluate women correctly in this perimenopause, menopause state, because the mind, the brain, according to Lisa Moscone, who's a big brain researcher, will tell you that as estrogen changes, the brain changes. Because menopausal women are supposed to be laid back, relaxing, not heading up companies. 
in Paleolithic life. But now your kids are gone, so now you're coming into your own almost when you're late 40s, early 50s to really succeed in something you want to do in life. But because your procreation ability goes down, your body starts going down that hill. And if you don't figure out each individual person, what they need, how they detox, what the appropriate estradiol, estriol balance is, do they need testosterone? Don't overshoot them like some of these people do with pellets. If you can optimize that, you can change that woman's life. And there's not enough people that do it. So what I think I'm very good at is that, and that's going to give you longevity. And then anything else you do, your microbiome testing, your micronutrient testing, your plasma, that's all icing on the cake. But that, those millions and millions of women in that age group, and again, late 30s, early 40s into 50s, because of the toxic world we're seeing, they're developing hormone shifts younger and nobody's helping them. Where does someone start? You got to kind of find somebody that really understands menopause or, or hormones. But the biggest thing you do you. is, I'm sorry? You, I'm Where do taking I your services. Okay, yes. so what I do with somebody that walks through the door is I do three things. I do hormone blood. They, so they, I... they start by walking through the door. So you take in person. Uh, sorry. People. Well, uh, no, I do everything virtual. So I would say in my meeting, I just walk through the doors ah. is a yes. So in my meeting, I would turn around, I get a history like every doc does, right? A basic history. But, but what, what you do once you, once you get an idea and the three big things I see in real estrogen brain changes are hot flashes during the day, sleep disruption in the middle of the night and brain fog. Those are the three key things that your brain doesn't have enough estrogen. So when somebody says, I'm starting to feel kind of off, those are the three key symptoms I look for. It doesn't mean you're not having issues if not, but those are usually the three keys that your estrogen's fluctuating. You get three big groups of blood that are going to give you an idea why this person doesn't feel good. So I will run follicle stimulating hormone, luteinizing hormone, estrogen, progesterone, free and total testosterone, and sex hormone binding globulins. Because the brain ovary connection, as it falls apart, the FSH elevates. So you will see the FSH where it is relative to the estrogen. Doesn't matter what time of the month you go, you can read that combo. And if the FSH is creeping up where the estrogen's a little bit low, you know you have an issue. I understand hormones fluctuate, but there's a tight knit combination of those two. And when they start to separate, it doesn't have to be obvious, but if you read the labs correctly, you can see that. The second part of that is I get vitamin D and ferritin and I get thyroid level. I get TSH, free T4, free T3, uh, reverse T3, and I get Hashimoto antibodies. So Hashimoto, right, is leaky gut, gluten sensitivity, inflammation problems. A lot of women don't realize that they've got an autoimmune inflammatory problem that's developed in their late 30s, early 40s, and that's why they don't feel good, and it's not a hormone problem. And remember, if your immune system is a mess, your body's going to go, I'm not having a baby in this. So your hormones will tip because your body's not going to let you get pregnant when it's not optimized, right? That's what the animals do. Summer ends, winter comes, vitamin D goes down, they get insulin resistant, they eat a lot of food and they go hibernate because it's not optimal to have a baby in the cave. So if your system's tipped, your hormones will be off. So I check that. And then last, I, I send people fasting. I do fasting glucose, fasting insulin, C-reactive protein, and leptin. Because if you've got somebody that's got elevated insulin and a, and a dysregulated inflammatory C-reactive protein, their hormones are a problem because their blood sugar is a problem. Now, when you develop estrogen dysfunction, your body realizes that you're not a procreator anymore. So paleolithically, they would pull you out of the optimal part of the tribe and they would put you in to watch the kids. So you would eat less. You would be sheltered less, so you'd have a less optimal life. So the way your body protects you is when estrogen drops, you actually mutate the receptor that insulin binds on. So now the same food you eat 
won't get into the muscle as easy. You have more glucose floating around. That creates more problems. And with lower estrogen, higher testosterone, relatively speaking, now your body thinks you're kind of like a guy and you put on belly fat. And that's why menopausal women gain that belly fat weight. And now when they gain that belly fat weight, it's an inflammatory weight, which also accelerates their aging. So I want to get that in line. Now, if I've got somebody who's got estrogen issues with the blood glucose, you've got it. I also get a salivary test. And the reason I do that is I want to look at tissue levels to see how their detox is. Their salivary estrogen is elevated and their blood levels are low. I treat them a little differently in how I give them hormones back versus if they're low in their tissue level because I know they can detox better. So that's when you read the difference between you're okay, your estrogen's fine, you're doing fine, but you're 43, you're 44, you're not quite the same as when you were 35. So even though I don't have to give you hormones, it doesn't mean that you don't have to respect the dropping estrogen and you can't eat the same thing. You can't just walk. You have to lift two to three days a week. You have to get your heart rate up. So in that transition, you have to take better care of your system. Make sure you're taking your vitamin D. Half the people will buy their supplements like their D. Their doctor will tell them it's low and then they take it for three weeks and they go, oh yeah, I forgot. So, so I tell them they have to take better care of that period of time. The woman that's low across the board, I give them compounded bioidentical estrogen and progesterone. And I use the salivary levels to, to decide where to start. I work them clinically until they're good. And then I do a 24 hour urine. Cause if you look at the estrogen and the progesterone in somebody in their twenties, thirties and forties in they're in a 24-hour urine collection on day 19, 20, or 21 of their cycle, you'll actually find it's pretty comparable. So if you're still cycling at 43, you actually have comparable often hormone levels to somebody who is 27. So all I want to do is take the menopausal woman just out of that range. I tell her and make her 47 and a half and keep that. So you fake the body out. You let the body go, hmm. Maybe I can still have a baby, but you don't drive the system through the roof. Now you've got insulin receptors a little more sensitive. The gut microbiome says, yeah, maybe we can still have a baby. So the microbiome diversity doesn't fall apart. You feed your muscle, your blood vessels, and your brain with estrogen, but you feed, and very important, you feed your bones not only with estrogen, but you myelinate. So so that your nerve fibers look like pieces of hair, but you have fat around them. We call that myelin. It almost looks like hair wrapped with bacon. Well, myelin is supported by progesterone. They actually used to hang IV progesterone in, and they may even still do it in the neuro ICU and people that are in car accidents, like without a helmet or motorcycle accidents, because it helps remyelinate up the nerve cells. So whereas you're getting neurodegeneration, the progesterone you add back, that's why even if you've had a hysterectomy, it's really important for you to talk to your doc to make sure that they give you, or I would tell the patient, I don't care what anybody's telling you, you need your bias, your estrogen, and you need your progesterone. You also need a physiologic amount of testosterone because if you shoot testosterone through the roof in a woman that's older, any woman, you actually slow down mitochondrial function. It's in the literature. So people that get pellets that shoot the testosterone up to 200 is crazy. You don't want to do that. You want to run your levels 20, 21, 22. So I make sure everybody runs around that level. And even some women, they're very sensitive to testosterone. They run levels lower and I give them testosterone cream and they get acne. So some of it's clinical. A lot of it's laboratory, but it's just bringing that together. Now you've stabilized that woman through that transition to now introduce, okay, get all your other longevity things that you want to do to keep you healthy. That was a long answer. <laughs> Dr. Diane Ginsberg, fourth slowest aging person in the world, vampire and ninja. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. It was fun.